Hey folks, Dan here. Today on the MicroArch Club podcast, I am joined by Nathaniel Huffman. Nathaniel is an engineer at Oxide Computer Company, where he helps build their RackScale Compute product. He previously worked at GE Healthcare on FPGAs for medical imaging systems. In this episode, we talk about the role of FPGAs in CT scanners, proprietary and open source FPGA tooling, the boot process for the Oxide server, and much more. Nathaniel also shares a number of anecdotes about building the Oxide rack with a remote team, including picking up servers in the parking lot of a cheese store in Wisconsin. The thoughtfulness and pragmatism that Nathaniel applies to building systems is evident throughout our conversation, and I'm certain that you'll find his insights and experience as valuable as I did. With that, let's get into the conversation. All right. Hey, Nathaniel. Thanks for uh, joining the show today. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, well, I-, I wanted to, and I kind of try to do this every episode, give a little bit of a backstory uh, for how we got connected. Um, I've mentioned before uh, in some of the previous episodes, the Oxide and Friends uh, podcast, or I... It, it is a podcast, but there's a the unique nature of that y'all do it on Discord and, you know, I can stop by and, and talk and that sort of thing. So I've heard you on there uh, a few times um, and uh, specifically was interested uh, in some of the things you talked about in regards to some of the FPGAs on the board. Uh, and also there was um, some, some vague mentions to your background. So I did a little bit more research and then uh, reached out. But um, definitely been uh, intrigued and grateful, actually, for for y'all to have that podcast. Um, and so glad to now have you uh, on my show here. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's been fun to do that. It's been fun to be able to talk about stuff that we're doing at work, just kind of out in the open. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, part of the the goal of the show here is to kind of uh, both talk. Uh, I guess the the primary goal is to talk about. Uh, technical concepts and, and get deep on that. But I think, uh, you know, folks background and experience informs some of the technical decisions or career decisions that they've made that have kind of placed them in, in their current situation. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about, you know, just you growing up, if you were interested in, in computers, if you're interested in hardware or software, um, and then kind of, you know, your education and that sort of thing. Sure. Yeah, well, I've always been kind of interested in how things work and understanding, um, you know, like the technology and the things around you and why they work the way they work and how they work. Um, I, I didn't have a big, um, uh, experience with any kind of hardware growing up really. Uh, you know, I, you know, I'm too young to have, uh, remembered all of the, like the transistor radios and I'm just slightly too old to have missed the, uh, like dawn of computers, you know, so I'm, you know, kind of like early eighties kid. And, uh, uh, but as like, as I've grown up, you know, I've been interested in, you know, various technology, you know, I was the guy who would program, uh, the VCR, you know, for mom and dad, you know, if you remember those, you know, everybody's right. always blinking 12 cause no one could figure that out. And I always enjoyed, you know, solving those kinds of problems and, and looking at that. And, you know, as I went through, um, middle school and high school, especially high school, I took a physics two class and physics two class had a lot of circuits in there. And I found circuits to be very fun. And so I was like, oh, this this is, you know, something very interesting. I like the pictorial representation of things and the model behind it. And, you know, understanding like this is how like most of our world today works is, you know, these you know, little tiny chips and resistors and things doing stuff. And uh, so, you know, my junior and senior years, I took uh, physics classes, you know, and I was starting to look into uh, what I'd want to go do. Um Electrical engineering seemed like a, an interesting spot. I, I was actually also interested in computer engineering, which like for a lot of schools is almost the same thing as electrical engineering, but with a more software-y focus. Uh, but I wasn't totally convinced that that was uh, maybe a, a mainstream, uh, like widely recognized degree mm. at that point in time. And so I went 
uh, with a, a BSWE. So that's, I majored in electrical engineering, uh, but I tried to opt for all of my uh, optional classes in engineering to be in the computer uh, engineering curriculum. So I took a lot of the programming classes, you know, I learned C, I learned microcontroller assembly, all of that stuff that uh, wasn't strictly required for doubly, but then I also took the painful classes like field and wave electromagnetics and, you know, stuff like that. So um, just, I thought that would be a little more of a broad marketing strategy. Like I was, you know, I was sure to get a job with a double E degree. It was a little unclear to me about computer engineering. Um, and I, I didn't really know really the difference between them other than what I just explained where, you know, one had a little more software and one had, uh, you know, a little less software. Right. Um, in at, so I, I went to Purdue, uh, I, I grew up in Indiana. So that was a, Purdue is a state school has a good reputation and an excellent engineering program. Um, I went there and, um, as you know, I had talked with other people and one of the big feedbacks that I got from people going before me was like, try to find an internship, try to find a co-op, something like that. And so, uh, Purdue has a neat co-op program where you sign up for this like rotational co-op program and you rotate in and out and do, uh, uh, the equivalent of like five semesters of work uh, okay. throughout throughout the um, the course of your studies there. And uh, Purdue is a little bit flexible about how you go about doing that. Um, but you can sign up like these companies sign up for, you know, coming on campus, interviewing people and you get connected up with a company. And, you know, there's some rules. You got to keep your GPA above a certain level and that kind of thing. But um, they sign up to like host you for the five sessions. And mm. so, you know, over the course of your, your career and that turns your four year BSWE degree into a five year degree. Right. Because you're rotating out to go do work, but you get the opportunity to do uh, work. And I would say like, that's probably the the biggest impact uh, that that anything had on me. I mean, I'm not sure I would have stayed in engineering without having done that. Really? Uh, because I thought like a lot of the engineering classes were very heavy theoretical, very heavy math. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with the theory or the math, but it like, at least for me, doesn't end up being very fun. And so, you know, you're like, wow, well, I, you know, I can do, you know, Euler's method or I can do like all of these, you know, like multivariate calculus, like how cool am I? Uh, but, but like, how does that translate into real things? And so getting the opportunity to go and work for a company, I got to see, oh, like you don't actually spend your whole day, you know, sitting there with a calculator solving differential equations. You actually build these like physical things and there's like a lot that goes on there. Uh, so GE, uh, at the time, Medical Systems, now GE Healthcare, was uh, one of the sponsors, a big sponsor of the co-op program there at Purdue. And so, um, you know, I was looking at different companies and I interviewed with them. My uh, my dad was actually a, a business administrator for a group of radiologists and was like, hey, oh, cool. that GE Medical Systems company, like they make neat equipment and they do like some neat stuff that really you know impacts people's lives. And, uh, so I interviewed with them and, you know, like the long story short is it worked out. And, you right. know, so I was up there for five rotations, uh, during my school career. And then, uh, as I graduated Purdue, I got to rotate onto one of the teams that I had worked on and just start my, my full-time career there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's a, a great experience to have. I kind of, in a different way, identify with the, uh, uh, somewhat of the frustration with the theoretical side. I studied um, computer science um, in, in a very theoretical computer science um, uh, program. I kind of feel like there's a, a bit of a spectrum there between like hands-on, like we're going to build applications and or like, you know, learn kernel development depending on what level you're at there. Um, uh, and then there's more of the academic side. And I definitely enjoyed it, but it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't necessarily the greatest preparation for industry, right? Um, right. But uh, I definitely, um, you know, one of the commonalities I find when um, talking to folks who, you know, have worked in hardware or, or worked in, uh, you know, chip design a lot on this podcast uh, is that kind of strong foundational background in electrical engineering um, or maybe computer engineering. But um, that's one of the things when I look back, you know, um, I think that everything kind of builds on that. So I think it's a really a useful background to have, uh, even if it is you know, you're, you're not solving differential equations all day per se. Right. Um, right. So yeah, but that's really yeah, cool. And, the, and certainly uh, I found, I found the theory to have paid off long term. It's just mm -hmm. that like, it's not a good taste for what like your day-to-day -day life is, right. but it's a lot of stuff that you do actually need to know in order to like understand how, you know, these circuits do actually work. Right. And so at GE, um, did you have any kind of like background or, or interest in the medical field or was that just kind of where it happened to have an engineering job. 
So that was kind of, you know, I uh, I knew them very well after my five rotations of right. uh, co-op time. And so I, I realized, you know, I, I like the technology. I like the people, uh, you know, as we'll, we'll get into it later. But, like, I got exposed to FPGAs there. And so, like, I was pretty convinced, you know, once I learned about an FPGA, and, and you know, we'll go through that. But I was like, that feels, I mean, that feels like I'm living in the future you know, you have these like right. these programmable chips and all this cool stuff. And so, uh, and they're pretty big uh, FPGA users in most of their applications there. And so it was, it was something that, you know, I knew whatever I wanted to do, I wanted to do something uh, related to FPGAs at the time. And it was just like, this, this is a good opportunity. And, and it's a neat product because, you know, you need CT scanners, like CT scanners have uh, certainly made uh, people's lives a lot better over the course of, you know, the last, you know, 40 years or so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's really interesting that, I mean, I guess it was just the domain, kind of like you were saying, that you got exposed to FPGAs um, kind of early on in that experience. Um, kind of talk about that fascination. I know just kind of from uh, reading things you've written, uh, looking at, you know, your your social profiles and things like that, you're definitely enthusiastic of, about FPGAs, which is uh, something I share. Um, they, I mean, they feel... Uh, as someone who kind of started to educate myself uh, around digital logic design, uh, an FPGA feels pretty magical, right? Because you can do yes. it in your, your home yes. office. Um, and, and so, yeah, tell me a little bit about like getting exposed to that and maybe some of that like fascination with it. Yeah, so I think, you know, like all good double E's, you go through a class, you know, that does digital logic. And so, you know, maybe you make an ALU or something with uh, like some pals and gals or like a bunch of discrete logic chips, but Mm -hmm. realizing that you can drop a chip like an FPGA down on a board and, you know, shoot some code into it after some, you know, magical software stuff happens. And that thing behaves exactly like that chip. Uh, I mean, it, it was just, I mean, it was just really fascinating. And, you know, you, you can kind of see like the older generation of engineer, you know, some of my mentors grew up in the era where like gals and pals, which are like early programmable devices came out. Mm-hmm. And so that was something, you know, you might get 10 gates in a chip or something. And so you could totally customize that chip and then drop that customized chip down. And it would, you know, be a few AND gates and an OR, and an or gate or, you know, some flip flops or that kind of thing. And like the kind of power that you get from being able to do that without having to drop down all this discrete logic. And if you mess up your, uh, you know, your Carnot map as you, you know, optimize all your logic away, or you forgot, you know, that, uh, like De Morgan says, you know, like AND gates and OR gates can do different things in active low circuits and, you know, all of those things. Right. Um, it's, it's very expensive and painful to change those, but like in an FPGA, you just, you just change it and you know you you compile again and you go and uh, assuming you didn't do something really bad like you know turn outputs inputs and blow up your pins and you know like it is still <laughs> hardware and like you can still break things but uh the other the other thing that i saw that was super fascinating is the thing that you go out with on day one for a product especially a long life product so you think you know a ct scanner is a, an investment for a hospital uh you know and they want to they want to have long life and longevity on that thing. Uh, The manufacturer wants to sell new features. And so Mm. the ability to go out with something where you, you have a set of features and then in the future you can download more features into it. And it, and it, it's like downloading hardware like that, that is, that does feel magical because it's, it's stuff that didn't exist on day one and, you know, on day 400 or day 300 or whatever, you can come back in and say, oh, I'm going to just like totally change this or add this totally new feature. And the hardware actually, you know, in some, some respects changes. I mean, it, it behaves differently than it did before. I mean, obviously the physical hardware is still, you know, exactly how you shipped it, but right. But that, that was a big feature because you realize you can monetize that and you can provide bug fixes. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of tension between um, with FPGAs and like FPGAs versus ASICs, right? There's a lot of tension there in the like cost. And, you know, we can talk about some of the trade-offs there. But the, the trade-offs um, in some ways, like it's very expensive to like tape out a chip, right? Right. And then once you've taped out that chip... Uh, I mean, even on like yesteryear's process, it's still pretty expensive. And once you've taped it out, like that's all the thing does. And so you you have to have all of the functionality in up front. You have to have everything tested, everything validated, and anything that you messed up, uh, you basically can't use or you have to find a workaround or, you know, whereas an FPGA, 
um, you, you have some flexibility there. And so you can say, well, I didn't even know I wanted this feature two years ago, but now I'm going to download this new feature in. And, or wait, we have this you know, totally unforeseen bug that occurs and we can work around that in an FPGA. So we just changed the FPGA. So those things are pretty powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the things that's interesting, I feel like when, when I was first exposed to FPGAs, uh, one of the things that I, was maybe a misnomer to me was like, oh, these we're reprogramming these all the time, right? Like, uh, and and maybe right. we are, but but they have a lot of value even if you never reprogram them. So it might just be economic value, right? It might be um, a life cycle of product development, um, or right. it could be like you know. A break glass in case of emergency kind of situation. Right, um, right. And so, yeah, so I, I'd love to learn a little bit more about how FPGAs were being used, right? What what context, why were they um, the optimal or good solution uh, for what y'all were doing at GE? Maybe, maybe when you initially got uh, introduced to them. Uh, you know, I think, so, I mean, some of it, I think, is the longevity there and the... Um, the ability to, you know, change and morph the design. Um, I would say like, we kind of went through a transition, you know, from when I f first started or maybe even before I first started, you know, back in like, you know, 06, 07, uh, into now where like the, you, it was hard to find processors that were like fast enough to do some of the things that we needed to do as well. Mm. So if you need uh, like hard real time, stuff like data processing or uh you know I, I mean we can talk a little bit briefly about like a ct scanner is uh basically has an x-ray tube and the x-ray tube shoots x-rays through the patient who's kind of in the middle of the the tube and it spins around the patient and you know apologies to any physicists but like the <laughs> you know the the really simple version is you basically take pictures at you know a bunch of different angles around the patient and then put those all back together into a 3d model of of the patient's body and like the, the detector can tell, uh, you know, how much stuff it, the x-rays went through given their attenuation and that kind of thing. Um, and so, uh, the way that reconstruction is done is by, uh, it's a process called filtered back proje projection. And so when I first joined, uh, or when I was first there as an intern, um, we were, uh, the team was using FPGAs to do filtered back projection because the data rates were so high. I and, mean, you know, we're talking 850 megabit or, you know, and, and so like not, I mean, not high in today's world, but high at the right. time. And so you're not like, and we didn't really have, I mean, you know, I mean, gosh, in, uh, in, you know, 2006, 2005, 2004, like what was your, what was your video card? like a GeForce 2 maybe or a GeForce right. 3 like the like we didn't have this big GPU offload and so in order to to make those uh, to reconstruct those images in a reasonable amount of time you sort of needed dedicated hardware and so some people would go off and make ASICs but like the algorithms change and and uh, that's a big spot where like you want to be able to iterate on your algorithm and mm -hmm. you want to be able to change things and you may find you know enhancements or uh, and so uh, they used uh, filtered uh, FPGAs for filtered back projection. So there was a, you know, PCI X board back in the PCI X days that had an FPGA on there and the, the computer would catch all the data and then run it through the FPGA to do filtered back projection. Um, the same thing on the acquisition side. So up on the rotating side, you have, uh, uh, you need to somehow like tell the system to take all those pictures mm -hmm. and that becomes a fairly real time thing. And you, you know, you have a, an encoder basically that tells you where, what angle you're at as you spin around the patient and you need to somehow correlate that to, uh, your image snapshots and make sure that your periods are all lined up. And, you know, depending on your algorithms, like, uh, you want them to be fairly precise because if you're assuming the ang angles are perfect, any imperfection in the actual, uh, sample of the data ends up turning into like poor images. Right. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you're, if you think you're going every, you know, every two degrees and you're really going every 2.1 degrees, like your image is going to be a little bit messed up when you reconstruct that. And so there's some real time applications there. And then again, like the data rates you're running. Uh, the other thing is uh, the, the CT scanner uh, spins. And so like very early versions of CT scanners would spin once to like get up to speed, spin around the person once to act, to acquire and then spin once slowly to stop. And they had a cable that basically like spooled up and unspooled when they did this. And then oh. they'd reverse that process backwards. Right. Um, it turns out like that has a lot of problems. Right. Uh, 
<laughs> and so, and then you also have like a lot of spinning things are easy when you don't have a patient in the center, but because you have a patient in the center, there's no like coaxial place to like, you know, put like butt up two optics or anything. So you have to somehow get all of this data from the rotating side to the stationary side. And there's a bunch of like, you know, somewhat proprietary technology that most of the CT scanner systems use these days. Uh, and th we call that a slip ring, but basically you have to shoot the data across a gap. And in order to get the data across a gap, you need to run a custom protocol. And so, we, we, you know, we can talk about uh, 8B10B protocol. So we have, uh, you know, as, as you're shooting data across um, you, what is effectively a capacitor, mm -hmm. it's like an AC coupled link. And so you need to you need to limit the number of ones and zeros that you uh, run in a row, because otherwise you start to bias that capacitor and like it stops ah. acting like a short at high frequencies, right? So because capacitors at high frequencies are shorts, um, and so. Um, you know, you're looking for like protocols that do some kind of encoding. 8B10B basically takes every 8-bit code word that you want to send, converts it into 10 bits, and it has a positive disparity and a negative disparity. So that, and then the algorithm keeps track of whether you have too many ones or too many zeros going, and will pick the opposite code word in order to balance the link out. And so, with 8B10B, uh, if I remember right, you get like five. You can have five uh, bits of of a one or five bits of a zero before you're guaranteed to see a transition, but that helps keep your, uh, your link, you know, DC balanced right. and at, at the cost of a 20% efficiency hit. So, mm. right. So every, like every eight, eight bits I meant to send, I'm actually having to send 10 bits. So I have, I'm paying a 20% penalty in order to get this encoding. And so, you, you know, as you look at other, other systems, um, like Ethernet, I think uses 6466. So they're paying something like, you know, what is that, 3% of a penalty uh, for their encoding. So it's a lot more efficient, but the, the number of the run length limit is like 80 bits instead of five. Mm -hmm. And so that didn't work for, you know, the physical ring technology. So you had FPGAs up on the, the station or the rotating side in order to encode that data and shoot it across this link and FPGAs on the receiving side to decode that data and, you know, split it all back out. And, uh, you know, kind of all kinds of, of control. I mean, most of the subsystems, I think, had FPGAs and, you know, they were used for various things. Um, we also did a lot of soft core processors there. And so, like, okay. rather than buy a, you know, like 68,000 uh, 68, microcontroller or, you know, buy a, a microcontroller, we would stick one in the FPGA. And so we had a number of subsystems that would run on soft core processors. And, you know, they, they didn't need to be super performant. They're mostly like, you kind of let the FPGA do the real time stuff. And they just kind of monitor and report and do like setup and cleanup at the end. And, mm -hmm. you know, so there's, there, it's not to minute, there's a lot of software there, but it doesn't have to be, you know, you're okay on a 150 megahertz processor, you know, and as long as it can talk ethernet or, you know, what have you. So. Right. And so you mentioned, uh, the, uh, PCIX, uh, board. So this was, y'all were not actually designing the, uh, boards with the FPGAs or on, you were just integrating them into your system. So Is that, that right? nope, that. That was a custom board. And, oh, okay. and at the time, I'm not sure what... Nowadays, you can go out to uh, an integrator and go find like a compute module, right? So you can get a PCIe card with an FPGA on there to do general mm -hmm. purpose you know, compute. I'm not sure what existed back in, in that time, but that was definitely custom hardware. And, okay. uh, I mean, so it was like, that was a custom design. And then, you know, you put that into a, a PC that it was, you know, mostly off the shelf and, uh, um, that would, uh, oftentimes the, those, like those were you, you know, they had a custom heat sink on there and everything. So, you know, they're, they're in there doing that, uh, as we progressed, you know, I, I kind of alluded to this before, uh, some of that stuff got eaten by GPUs because it's easier to just go buy a commodity GPU and do your back projection, uh, on a GPU based algorithm, you know, you can use OpenCL or what have you and, um, and do that a little more efficiently. So in, in later generations of the system, you see the FPGA is kind of moving moving out of the actual like back projection and the image processing flow and more, but, but staying and even increasing in the uh, like the data acquisition and the data capture side. Right. And so um, uh, on a later gen system, for example, we had an FPGA that would catch all of the data from the slip ring 
and then turn that into TCP packets. And so we had uh, oh, our own custom like TCP offload engine there where the uh, we can buy a, a commodity computer and the commodity computer can can connect with 10 gigabit ethernet one or more 10 gigabit ethernet to this uh to this card open up a tcp stream and then just catch all of the data basically flying you know in the system and you right. know keep track of it and store it to disk and everything so that that got us kind of out of some of our like can we put our custom, you know, custom stuff inside this other computer and you get into like warranty challenge and logistics challenges and all kinds of stuff there. Right. That's really interesting. Were you all using um, FPGAs pretty much from all specific vendor or did y'all have um, a number of different vendors that you all uh, sourced we from? Were, we were mostly uh, an Altera who's now Intel, but now going to become right. their own thing again. <laughs> right. Um, shop, um, you know, through over... Like GE does use a bunch of them, but like my team specifically was mostly Altera just because we had a good working relationship with them. And, you know, what what we found is like, you know, o over the course of my career there, you notice we were like cutting edge technology, you know, early you know, we're having a hard time getting, you know, 10 gigabit transceivers. And, and so like we were using external parts and a Zowie interface to go from an FPGA that didn't have internal transceivers to get a 10 gig interface. Cause that was cutting edge at the time. And then, you know, fast forward a few years and it's a, a, all the FPGAs have, you know, you can buy an FPGA with 10 gig, like 10 gig, <laughs> that's no problem. You know, right. what about 28 or, you know, 32 or so. Um, so like, kind of over the course of my career there, you see, we saw it kind of move from like the high end part families to often the more mid rangey part families, just because uh, technology and especially in the communication space, just really just keeps going up and up. And like, at some point, you know, there's only so much reasonable amount of data that you can like capture. And there's only so much you can ship across a slip ring and that kind of thing. So you have some like other limits that don't allow you to just like continue chasing the like forever technology curve. Right. And you mentioned your, your team there. What was the composition like of your team? And, you know, were you all directly interfacing with, you know, all the folks that, you know, were designing the mechanical parts of the, the CT scanner as well? Or what, what was the kind of team structure like there? Yeah, we were, so we were organized there uh, on a hardware team. So I was on a team of about, uh, I mean, it varied, you know, somewhere in the 30 to 50 range, but that included all of your like electrical engineers and all of your mechanical engineers. So basically all of the like traditional, you know, like hard hardware engineering roles were all on the same team. And we all reported to like one or more managers kind of in the same organization. Uh, and then our embedded team, you know, had, you know, they were sometimes with us and sometimes not depending, you know, like all these big companies like to reorg frequently to, you know, change right. things up a little bit. But we worked, I mean, certainly the those of us on the FPGA side worked very closely with our embedded software engineers. Uh, because, you know, a lot of our interfaces and their interfaces are like, you know, tied together, you know, very, very closely. And so right. I can't just go change registers without letting my software guy know like, hey, we're going to, we need to make this change. And like, we have to do it together so that, you know, we don't break the world. So. Right. Absolutely. Is the, um, uh, were the soft cores that you mentioned that were uh, on the FPGAs, were those uh, programmed by the embedded team or was that more things that, um, you know, you mentioned it's more like reporting and that sort of thing. Would y'all, would your team be writing the software that kind of uh, uh, ran the on embedded the embedded team core? wrote, wrote most of the software on the microcontrollers. So we did, uh, we had a number of ways to test our hardware, you know, some through using some uh, APIs that those guys provided for us as well as uh, you know, we could get in there uh, in, in their later gen products, we could get in there with, uh, we had a little shim basically that would run and we could get in there with a Python tool and, mm -hmm. you know, like exercise our registers or do various testing. And so that, you know, that was, we would write a lot of that because that's a lot of like boring low level functionality. That's mostly just a smoke test that, you know, everything got done exactly right. Um, and that, but all of the application code was done up on the, uh, embedded by the embedded team. So, gotcha. And, and how was the, uh, what was the programming process like? So you kind of like alluded to that with, you know, g getting in there and being able to debug and that sort of thing. But obviously with FPGAs, you have to store a bit stream somewhere. What, what right. did that look like yes. in this architecture? Yeah. So, uh, so with FPGAs, you know, uh, most of these designs um, had onboard flash of some okay. type. And so, you know, it, it varied. I mean, early, early on parallel nor flash was kind of the like popular thing. And so uh, in fact, a lot of those early designs had uh, CPLD, which is basically a little tiny FPGA 
that um, that often has its own internal flash. And so it would have a little like shim loader that would know how to go master the um, the NOR flash, the parallel NOR flash, and load bit streams into the bigger FPGA. Um, in later gen devices, I mean, parallel flash becomes kind of expensive in terms of pins because, you know, you have a whole address bus and a whole data bus out there uh, right. and you start burning up a lot of pins. And it, it, it actually isn't very fast either in, in, you know, in the grand scheme of things. And so um, a lot of the later gen designs started using serial flash. And so but in the same way, it's serial nor often quad spy. And uh, the the processor inside the like the soft core processor or in in some cases a hardcore processor sitting outside would be able to have access to uh, getting to that part either through FPGA logic like a spy core in the FPGA or it would have you know physical wires on the bus so it could reprogram that and then we'd reboot the board and it would re- or tell it to reconfigure and it would reconfigure itself out of flash. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. And that's, but uh, so that, yeah, that means like if you, anytime you want to, you know, in, like when you're debugging in a system, anytime you want to like try a new bit stream, you, you know, you have to burn a new bit stream and get it into the, the software load or patch the software somehow, and then run flash download on the system and get it all patched in there and then reboot the system and bring it all back up so you can test it. Gotcha. So, you know, it ends up being kind of a, like, especially system level test, it becomes kind of a, like, it's, it's an expensive thing to do for time because you have to like bring the whole system down and bring it back up every time you do it. So we, we would often have, um, I had a, like a CI environment uh, with a, a copy of each of the boards from the system that were all connected up on the same network together, uh, mm. but weren't, I mean, obviously there's no like table to move up and down and there's no system to spin. And right. so, you know, but with FPGAs, we could build fake things. And so I could build, uh, I could build a hardware module that looked like an encoder right and so it could spin it could generate pulses and so i could drive my product design with this fake encoder in the fpga by you know wiggling some bits and turning some things on that we didn't use in product uh, but i could simulate that there on the on the bench and so we did a lot of that as well and uh kind of we got to you know on the the later gen stuff we had a lot of hardware in the loop testing so you know we had ci that would run and build our fpgas and it would auto deploy down to you know our test bed and we'd run some tests again it and and you know if you find something it's nice to find it there before you hand it off to the software team so that they don't have to come back to you and tell you hey you messed something up or like it doesn't work or you know that register you told me you put in here i can't read it you know things like that so right yeah that's one of the things that i noticed kind of uh when, when looking at some of the things you've written and, and some of the things you've worked on it feels like um you know me coming from a, a bit of a, a software background it feels like you've kind of had this pattern of applying uh, software development principles into hardware or, you know, if you want to call right. FPGAs hardware as well, development lifecycle as well. Uh, was that something that, you know, you were exposed to, or is it more just like, Hey, these are obviously good principles that we should apply I, here. Uh, I mean, that's something I think that, I mean, I think it really was something I, I just saw there's all this capability and like, I mean, I don't know how many billions of dollars being spent on like software developer productivity, right? Like right. there are these tools and CI and, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, why can't we have nice things too? Right. And, and, you know, so, w- and when you're looking at it, it, you know, I mean, it's interesting, the, the whole electrical engineering world, I think, has gone through kind of a transition over the past, you know, 20 or so years where uh, a lot of times it was, you know, originally it was just, it was very like hardware oriented people. And now like you need hardware and software to do almost anything. And, and so like being able to steal some of the like good work that, you know, whether it's like, let's have, you know, our bill. I mean, I remember, you know, when I first started, um, I, you'd get to a spot in the day where it's like, well, if I don't push build now, then I don't have, I'm not done until, you know, like 6 30 PM. And I would like to go home and eat dinner. And, right. and so, I mean, we had engineers who like were driving home with their laptop on their, on the front seat of their car while they're doing a build, hoping that you don't get a license pull during, you know, during that portion of the build where you don't have uh, internet connectivity and right. stuff like that. And it was like this, you know, this, this feels a little silly and like, can't we do a little better? And so that was one of the things where, you know, we look at, look at the software, like software teams have, I mean, computers are pretty cheap. Let's go buy some computers and figure out how to automate these builds. And so when you check into 
source control, like a build should just kick off. And, um, and then, you know, if it's, if it's a build for an hour, like that's no big deal. If it's a build for five hours, like that's a lot, a lot bigger deal. And so, you know, one of the designs I was working on near the end of my time there had a, a five and a half or six hour build, which wow. you know, in the grand scheme of FPGAs, I like, I feel like that's like, that's a middling build time. I mean, you can have much, much worse in much bigger designs, but that was a 900,000 LE design. So it was a big, big design. And, um, that's one where you realize like I can make a change in the morning and be able to test it in the afternoon. And if I'm, if I'm really lucky, I can get a fix in, in the afternoon and get another build before I have to go home. And, and, and then your, your computer is just sitting there all day, just like, right. you know, chewing on the thing. And so like being able to offload that to a server somewhere and, you know, even if it's just in the basement or in, in the electrical lab or whatever, and let it go sit there and chew on it while I can go do other things is super powerful. And, and then you don't have this like fear, like, well, if I don't, you know, if I don't get a build going by, you know, one fifteen, then like, there's no way I, I, you know, I'm making it to pick my kid up from school or, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, hard evening activity you have. Right. And so there's just a lot of things that, uh, I, I, I think a lot of teams are coming to that realization, you know, especially over the last 10 or so years that there's just things that we need to do. But, you know, when you look at the EDA tools and that kind of thing, they're really not structured to make life easy that way. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like kind of different than like a cloud native software development where, you know, like, Oh no, this is just like, I have a GitHub action and it just like does the thing. It's like, it's not so much like that. And you look at, I mean, you know, as you well know, like a Vivado install or a Quartus install is like, I don't right. know, 40 gigabytes, 60 gigabytes. So like, that's not something that, you know, you can just like download every day and run. And so, you know, you need to think about like, how do we set this up in a way that makes our developers productive? And, but it's been fun to be able to look and see all of the different things that the software teams are doing to, you know, get better tests and get better, uh, better build times and that kind of thing and try to apply those into the hardware workflow and, you know, fight with the tools a little bit to do that. But that's an area where I'm, I'm super interested and in. like, I kind of lean, you know, I'm a hardware guy that leans towards software. And so I like the software stuff. Um, and so, you know, like the flip side is there are a lot of software people kind of lean toward hardware and like FPGAs are a cool place to play too. So we kind of like live in this like Goldilocks zone, I think. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, uh, it, it brings up a, a lot of um, ideas that um, I, w I won't go too deep on this, but in my, my day job, I work for a company that makes a lot of firmware and, um, we've started using uh, GitHub Action self-hosted runners. Um, and so we all have like Raspberry Pis. At, it's a remote company. And then, uh, you know, a bunch of dev boards plugged into them. And uh, it is it is really magical to see kind of um, services like that that make it really easy to have your own self-hosted runners, um, whether it, you know, is at your house or, or at your place of work or whatever, because you get right. that same configuration and workflow for both the software uh, and the hardware. And obviously, you know, we're not having to deal with, well, we, we do have to deal with some uh, very onerous uh, microcontroller programming frameworks and tools, but not not quite to the degree of uh, working with FPGAs. But I, I'd love to learn a little bit more about, and, and maybe also like describing for the audience to talk about maybe what that time, you know, that five to six hours is made up of, because, um, you sure. know, when you're, you're working with FPGAs, uh, it's a little bit different than compiling software, right? There's a number of steps you go through and there's things you can do earlier in that process to maybe catch something, you know, before you've invested five to six hours. Um, so what, right. what were some of the methodologies that y'all used and what, what tooling as well? I mean, so, uh, I mean, just in general on the process, you know, you figure like an FPGA build kind of goes through, I, you know, it depends, but I mean, call it three or four phases basically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can carve those up into like different ways if you want, but uh, you essentially have to take the design as written. So you, you have some kind of RTL design that you've you know written in Verilog or VHDL or some alt HDL. And um, you have to, you have to compile that and run it through, you know, syntax uh, analysis, like uh, they call it a analysis and elaboration in some tools. And, but basically you have to go through that and make sure no typos, no, like, you know, stupid problems, you know, no output pins, driving inputs and, you know, like things, things like that, make sure all your blocks are wired up, everything, you know, is a okay. And so that, that takes, you know, a reasonable amount of time. I, I feel like, you know, like the tools aren't super fast, but you know, you're talking, you know, some number of minutes for a very large design and, you know, 
I, I don't know, like maybe 15 minutes for a very large design and not so bad um, for stuff underneath that. And so like if, if the syntax all checks out and everything, you know, no gross errors there, then it moves on into synthesis. And so that that takes your your description and turns it into an effectively like a logic map that is like this is the logic function that you're creating with all this stuff. Right. And so that's where, you know, if you remember doing truth tables back in, you know, e, e you know, whatever, 200 or whatever where uh, you do your Carnot maps and your logic optimizations and all of that. The tool is doing all of that for you. So it's it's taking your basic design, doing some some synthesis optimization and trying to come out with like, you know, here's the number of, of things that you need and here's how all the stuff is connected. And then, uh, then you go into... Uh, like a place and route. And so, you know, you, you drop those blocks down and like those things have to map into the FPGA that you're, you know, the, the FPGA is kind of like a big array of logic. And so you have to map that logic, synthesized logic design into the technology that you have. And like, there are a few different things that go into that. You have, you know, a certain number of flip-flops and lookup tables and that kind of thing where all of this stuff has to, um, has to get uh, mapped into but uh, you also have then the interconnect between each one of those, you know, like a lot of these, a lot of the, uh, the vendors will have something like a CLB or an ALM, which is some collection of like, it's like a lookup table and a couple of flip flops and maybe some like clock routing and some stuff. And then all of those share routing amongst, you know, between them. So you have to, you have to both lay this whole logic design down on that array and get everything wired up. And then you have to say, okay, so my clock happens every 10 nanoseconds or 15 nanoseconds or whatever. Can all the signals make it between all of the different places in the right amount of time? And if not, then we're going to pick up some of these blocks and like move them around and drop them back down and try again. And so there's kind of this, you know, uh, there's like a simulated annealing process that happens there because you don't want to get stuck like you, you, they kind of throw it all down sort of randomly ish and then right. like try to optimize. Uh, and they don't want to, you don't want to get stuck in a local minimum where you're like, Oh, everything I do is like a little worse. You want to make sure you can like toss a, a bigger change in there. Cause you might be able to find a much, much better fit. And so the, and, and they all, you know, all the tools have different algorithms for doing this. And there are, um, some strategies for, you know, making that smoother. And then, uh, you know, the way I like to think of it is like each, each of these phases has like so many credits to spend. And at a certain point, the tool like runs out of credits and stops. Right. And right. so it's like, it has to move on. And so it's like, I I've gotten enough where, or I can't get any more and you know, it moves on. And so then, you know, after you get there, um, into, so you, now you have like a design, it's all mapped down onto your chip. Everything is kind of uh, put together. Then you got to go build the bit streams and you know, all of that stuff. So that all happens kind of at the end. And uh, a lot of the tools then will, you know, tell you like, hey, uh, you know, all those timing constraints that you put in up front to say, you know, I have to make all this logic work. Yeah, you passed or, uh, you know, and sometimes you did not pass. And right. I tried really hard, but sorry. And uh, so those things happen. Um, and then, you know, like, so all of that basically is dependent on the, the design, the amount of logic you're inferring, right? So when you, when you build all this stuff, you build a small design, a uh, few thousand LEs, it takes a few minutes. You build something that's, you know, hundred thousand LEs, it takes more minutes and you build something that's a million LEs, it's, you know, hours. And so, but like those phases happen for each of them and they kind of, you know, each part scales, I would say with the design, but the analysis and uh, synthesis often happens much faster than kind of the rest of it. So getting the rest of it all laid down is kind of a, like it's a multivariate optimization problem that I think is really challenging. And, you know, there's a lot of research going on and to make that better. Uh, so that all happens. Uh, that's, and, and like your fans are running on your laptop and you know, whatever, right. if you're doing all of that. So, um, the way we would do our workflow, uh, there, we were using, uh, Jenkins to do our builds. So we had a server that had our Cordis versions. Cordis is the like software like Vivado from, from Intel. Mm -hmm. Um, and it had them installed and it would, you know, monitor the source changes. And so when you push a change to source control, then it would go pull down the design and rebuild. Uh, there are things you can do, uh, a lot of the, because it's so expensive, there's incremental compilation flows where you try to save the results from your last build and only like only change the like little bit of things that you change. 
Um, we didn't do a lot of that both because it was hard. It was hard to figure out how to like on a, like on a cloud of multiple machines, how to save the artifacts in an appropriate way so that they could be recovered. And then you, we, we also liked reproducible builds. And so what that means is every time you, you push the button, go, you get the same binary coming back out. Mm -hmm. And with incremental builds, that's not true because like some portion of that binaries, like history is your last, however many builds. And, um, that, you know, it can save you some time and it's useful for certain things, but we like to do clean builds from source control. So we'd get, if I built the same design with the same version twice, I would get the same, you know, like binary checksum even on the part that coming out. So that's what we like to see there. Um, let's see, what else did I miss there? Well, I, one of the questions I had was, uh, so the, the, you mentioned that the tooling, right. Kind of like runs out of credits at some point, but you also mentioned this binary reproducibility is our builds always deterministic from the same source with, with the tooling you are using. And is that true for across all tooling for, um, a synthesis and place and route? So I'm not sure I can answer that generally. I, I okay. don't know that that's true. I know that for, for us on a clean checkout, we would get the same fit and route, assuming that you didn't change the seed. And so there was okay. some algorithmic uh, determin like deterministicness to to how this worked. And so uh, you some some places uh, I know do seed sprays too. And so you can do uh, so like say you you miss miss timing means like my timing constraint says my you know I have to meet my setup and hold times on a flip flop, and mm -hmm. so I have you know so much budget to do that, and I miss by like a tiny tiny bit. Uh, right. There are certain kinds of designs where you're really pushing the envelope of the fabric. And so you know that you're going to see failures occasionally. And so uh, they'll do like, uh, you know, a, a seed spray technique where they'll kick off multiple builds at the same time, but with different uh, starting seeds. And uh, and then that will give you different fits for each one of the, for you know, even though it's the same source because you've manually altered like some of the starting conditions with the seed it basically alters how it drops everything down originally and so that'll get you a different fit and you can find designs where um you know you can characterize that you'll reliably meet timing you know some portion of your builds and that might mm -hmm. be okay for a certain application so um right. you see, i think you see that in like compute type applications a lot where you have an algorithm that's very like tight to fit or difficult to to work with you'll see that kind of thing where uh they just need one that works and it's okay that it you know it takes three or four tries to get there um for the stuff that we were doing uh generally we didn't live like that uh we would we're more we were more apt to change the design to make it easier to fit on the first try every try and so that was kind of where we would sit but we had we had the luxury of having you know fairly decent sized parts with with some extra room and we weren't running like right up to the hairy limit of what the parts could do. And right. so then, you know, adding an, a pipeline stage or doing something just makes your life easier. And so we'd be willing to do that generally. Gotcha. So, uh, it, it is uh, very nice that y'all had, um, not unlimited logic elements, but you know, you, you did have uh, some headroom there. Were there, yes. um, cases that you either needed to optimize a design to fit within the constraints? Um, I guess whether it be logic elements or timing or something like that. And what was yeah. kind of your, your strategy and approach? So, I mean, when, when I failed timing, um, the timing tools are pretty good in a lot in, in especially in your top tier tools. So, you know, you look at, uh, Xilinx or, uh, or Intel's or I guess AMD and Intel. Now, um, you look at their tools, they're really good at telling you like where your critical path is. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you can often go and just look at your design and say, okay, like, yeah, I have a lot of logic going on in this critical path and, um, maybe I can pipeline this better or change something or, you know, add a register stage. One of the tricks though, is like going back to the, like the concept of it having credits and giving up. Sometimes the critical path that fails is a, is a critical path that fails, but it's not the one that it was working the most difficult, like the hardest. Right. On. And so like some other thing might be causing like, you know, it's like squeezing a balloon, right. Where, you know, you get like this other bulge just like pops out somewhere else. And, um, and so like, those are a little bit trickier problems to solve because, uh, you don't exactly know what's going on there. 
Um, but you know, you can look at some of the fitter reports and that kind of thing and try to figure out where it is, uh, where it's spending its time and decide maybe, oh, maybe I have like something that's not very optimized over here and it's spending way too much time trying to get that to fit. And because it worked so hard over there, it just gave up on this, this thing it should have been able to do easily. So that, that's an area where, you know, it just, it requires some play and, and, you know, there are tricks that you can play there. I mean, oftentimes, uh, you use, uh, design partitioning and stuff. So you can go like build certain portions of the design and lock those down and then see if, you know, like, does the, does the bulge in the balloon come out somewhere else? And so, right. you know, you can kind of like, you know, characterize it. And then, and then if you're really having trouble, oftentimes you can get help from your FAE and, you know, they'll take a look at their design and, you know, they can run some metrics on it and try to figure out like, here, try this. Or, you know, they, they get the experience of meeting lots of customers and seeing lots of designs. And so they have, you know, try this optimization or try this kind of thing. On the logic side, um, you know, one of the, uh, one design I worked on, so the uh, we had a CPLD that was loading the FPGAs and the CPLDs are pretty small. So, you know, they're 1200 LE kind of parts. So they're, mm -hmm. you know, it's a very fast build, but there's only so much space. And on, on some of those designs, um, we were, we were struggling to like, we wanted to have a core, like a core FPGA or CPLD design that would run on all of our boards and do the loading for everybody. Um, and, but, you know, there are a few different configurate, you know, as you, you go through the different designs, you know, somebody used active low resets and somebody did, you know, like the board is like a little tiny bit different over here. And so you have all of these things that you have to like, you know, you have all these knobs that you have to turn. And, you know, we got into a spot there where, you know, it, it really actually mattered, um, like we were running out of flip flops. And so mm -hmm. what you end up doing in those cases is, you know, you start thinking like, okay, do all my counters need to be 32 bits? What if I can right size all my counters? So you, you make a little flip, you, you make a function that then takes the you know parameters from the user and shrinks everything down the way you exactly want. And so like, there are some games you can play there and um, you know, can I run certain things, you know, can I share hardware in a certain place or um you know, like those kinds of things. And so like, but it's all very design dependent. I think there it's, it's really hard to have kind of a, a one size fits all optimization story. And I, I think that's true, you know, in software too, but you, you like, it's one of those things you have to measure it. Right. Cause you don't know where sometimes you don't know where the problem is. Right. And, right. and you can look and, and depending on how the design is being built and depending on how much IP there is, you might find places where maybe you wired something up to a pin, but you know, that pin is strapped to a, like a logic high level. Right. Mm -hmm. But the design doesn't know that. And so the, the synthesizer and optimizer don't know that you could potentially stick that to a zero or a one in your RTL and watch a whole bunch of things just optimize out because now it can make choices about things that it knows. And so th those are like, you know, some areas that you can look at in there to see what's going on and, and how to save a little space. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we, we also talked a little bit um, in, in our, our meeting yesterday about um, um, the uh, use of, of uh, kind of like vendor IP, right? So you, there's, you know, obviously you could write all of your RTL, um, uh, but there's also, you know, maybe soft cores are a good example that you can take off the shelf. Uh, I'm curious how much you all use soft cores and also just like maybe generally taking that to talk about modularity um, and being able to have reusable components across um, yeah. uh, these various devices. Yeah. So, I mean, I think some of it depends on your, like your corporate strategy for what you want to do around IP. Uh, sometimes, I mean, like um, we'll talk about zero rapid IO possibly. And like zero rapid IO is a moderately complicated protocol. And there's a kind of, a, you know, I mean, it, you have say 10,000 LEs worth of stuff in there. Um, it's nice to be able to go grab one off the shelf and like mm -hmm. drop it into your design and have a data sheet that says this is how it works and, and use it. And like, that's, that's pretty good. And so it, and so long as it works the way you want and the way it's advertised, like that's usually fine. You know, there are lots of things like, um, I mean, you can find IP for just about anything. I mean, uh, the vendors do a pretty good job of providing some base IP for stuff that you need. So, you know, you have UARTs and interrupt blocks and that kind of thing. Uh, and then, I mean, beyond that, you can go out and buy 
IP. So you want a TCP offload engine, you can buy that. You want an NVMe controller, you can go buy that. You can, you know, you want uh, a CAN core, you can go buy that. I mean, there are lots, lots of these things. Um, uh, what I have found is that like, there are there are reasons to do that and and those mm-hmm. can be uh, economic reasons like sometimes it just makes sense to pay the money and go buy a, a known thing and get support for that and but you just have to understand that you are integrating somebody else's stuff and when you're integrating somebody else's stuff especially when it's like an encrypted ip core where you don't get to see the source when there's a problem or if there's a problem you're going to your third party uh, support person is going to be involved in getting you a solution and you're kind of at their mercy for, um, you know, for what, what can happen. And, and like, sometimes that works out great and sometimes that doesn't work out so great. And so, uh, you know, generally I think philosophically, I like, I like to design as much of the IP as I can, but mm-hmm. there are certainly places where you, you need to use IP. And so there are places where, especially if you need hardware resources, a lot of these, a lot of the FPGAs now have uh, PCIe blocks and stuff inside there. And like, there's no way to just magically get access to them. You have right. to go through some of the, the IP wizards. Uh, but for stuff like um, for flip flops and FIFOs and stuff like that, I, I would prefer to infer them if I can. Mm-hmm. And so I would like to write um, RTL of some sort that actually, you know, does the correct thing and gets uh, and gets the implementation that you want. Uh, dual port RAMs are a good example of that. I don't like using uh, vendor wizards for dual port RAMs if I don't have to, uh, because they're annoying to simulate. Oftentimes you have to have, you know, encrypted simulation models and all of this stuff. Uh, if you can find a way to write your IP, your own IP, in your RTL and get it to infer the correct structure. So you're actually using RAM when you think you're using RAM and not using, you know, a billion registers instead of the RAM that you intended to use, um, right. which, which can happen. You have to be careful about that. Um, that that's certainly the preferred path I think for me. And so I, I try to limit the IP uh, to places where it really makes business sense. And then if you have to do that, um, you also have to realize like when you, you hit your wagon to, to that, like you're sort of, locking yourself into that IP unless you take steps to make sure that you have like a clean interface break. Right. And like interfaces are all hard, but uh, if if you expect to be portable and you want to go jump to, you know, some, you know, you're on an an Intel chip today and you'd like to go to a Xilinx chip tomorrow, you really need to think about uh, how you architect your design so that where you use IP is properly separated Mm -hmm. and you have nice, clean, uh, like somewhat standard interfaces to get in and out of that stuff. Uh, so that it, it's easier to move move your design to you know a different device or a different technology. I mean, wh- one of the things that that we found is that even um, even in the same vendor, but among different device families, you can have variances in the IP that they generate that are maybe just like it's maybe like the stereo in your car where like the models come, you know, at like slightly different years. And right. so, you know, you look at an older, an older version and it still has the old model and a new version has a new model. Uh, and they're mostly the same, but like, how do you build, uh, and en- like enterprise modules that can use either one without really caring. And so, you know, building wrapper modules and understanding what standard interfaces look like is uh, key to a lot of that, I think. And that, that was something we did with our Sewer Rapid IO course. Um, w- you know, depending on which part family you have, you get different options and different things. And so we built kind of a, a shim, basically, that had the same interface to the designs. And then would, you know, you'd swap in a different shim for a different core. And, uh, but that way the rest of the design can kind of all look the same and, and you can simulate right. and, you know, do all the things that way. Right. That makes a lot of sense for the, uh, the serial rapid IO. Um, can you talk a little bit about w- what that is and, uh, why y'all, y'all were using it and, and as well as like sure. what the alternative to, to using it would have been? Oh yeah. So, uh, serial rapid IO, I think is, <sighs> It's a very interesting protocol. I uh, we were really happy with it. It is a it's a Certes based protocol, so it's a high speed. Uh, I we were we were sitting on Gen one point three switches, so that was like two point five gigabit. Uh, I, I think the Gen one point three maybe also did. Uh, 
3.125 or something, but uh, we did 2.5 gigabit um, and we used it as our, our general networking. So es essentially uh, in like it inter subsystem, you know, between subsystems, we would use a serial rapid IO link. And so every subsystem they're, they're like, entrance onto like being a part of the system was you have a serial rapid IO link and that's okay. like you connect up to a serial rapid IO switch from, from a networking topology, it looks a lot like ethernet. So you have, you know, it, like a, a star topology basically where you have, um, all of your nodes and they connect to switches and you can, you know, the switches are all crossbar switches and you can do all kinds of fancy stuff. That's, that's in contrast to something like a PCIe, which is also transceiver based, but PCIe and PCIe does have switches and things too. But when you look at a PCIe topology, there's typically like a host controller and uh, that's kind of like managing the whole system. Mm -hmm. And um, when you think about um, the way that the system was architected, we really wanted more of a like peer to peer uh, networking architecture. So PCIe uh, didn't feel great for that. Um, and then uh, you look, then Ethernet, I mean, is the obvious one because like Ethernet's way cheaper and everybody uses that, right? Right. Um, the big thing that drove us to Zero Rapid IO is we actually wanted uh, transceivers. And we wanted transceivers because the way that system worked um, was. Uh, we had a synchronized clock that was running in each of the FPGAs uh, on all of the subsystems. So we had a concept of global time. And once once a, a node joined the network and got set up and synchronized to the global time, then its counter was uh, like frequency locked to all of the other boards in the oh, system. Interesting. So that you could schedule events and say like at system time 42, do this. And like some subsystems, uh, you know, we, there were some mechatronic assemblies. So like things had to move. And so if they know, like, I have to be in position by system time 42, then I better mm -hmm. start my move at system time 27 so that I'm ready to go at 42. And, and you, but you can synchronize um, all of your nodes that way. And so we were, when we were looking at building that architecture, uh, Ethernet um, didn't have a great story around that. Um, the, there was like time synchronized time synchronous Ethernet is a thing now uh, that that was kind of coming onto the scene. But uh, being able to, you know, all of the transceivers, you get an RX clock coming out of the thing that comes out of the CDR. So CDR is clock data recovery. So you basically get a clock off of the bits that are coming in the receive port and generate mm -hmm. a frequency locked. Uh, and so you use the bit stream as your clock. And um, that because all the transceivers have that intrinsically, it's just a matter of pulling that RX clock out and running it into a counter and then doing a little bit of uh, synchronization um, when a system joins the network to like help get it into the, you know, about the right time. And like a couple of clock ticks at, uh, you know, we were at uh, uh, 125 megahertz, maybe or 62.5 megahertz. So a couple of clock ticks doesn't really matter. You know, you're talking a few nanoseconds here or there, but once you get them within a couple of clock ticks, then all of the events are, you know, the whole system, any board in the system has a concept of global time and you can schedule, uh, you can schedule future events or um, do some safety critical stuff that way because you, you have some, some concept of like time. And so if you send packets um, with that time embedded in there, then you can figure out, oh, like this node is behind or this node's ahead or it, you know, like there, there's a lot of magic that you can do. And so then in combination with an FPGA, the, the, the benefit that you have is like, I can build hardware blocks like FPGA blocks mm -hmm. that can multiplex into that zero rapid IO stream. And on the, on a receiving side, demultiplex right out of that receiving stream without the upstack software having to like see or do anything with it. So I can get hard right. real time FPGA to FPGA communication that doesn't enter it. Like it's in band multiplexed in. it's just a different packet format that goes through the wire. Um, and then we did uh Sierra Rapido has this concept of message passing. And so like they have a whole standard for how you send messages. And so we, uh, we built a core that did that and it does all the retransmission and everything. 
uh, but our embedded software team would run uh, Ethernet frames over that. And so you get oh, TCP and UDP. So they get to live in a world that like makes sense to them, right? Like they can talk sockets between things and you know, all, all the like standard stuff. Um, but we get this magic FPGA to FPGA side channel communication right through the same interface, which was pretty mm -hmm. cool. And, and the final benefit, which is way different than Ethernet, is uh, Zero Rapid IO has a... The con like it has guaranteed packet delivery between two nodes. And so like every packet that goes out on a link gets acknowledged at the, like it, there's a hardware handshake that occurs. And so if there's a bit error that messes that packet up mm -hmm. uh, or the packet disappears or whatever, uh, the two link partners go through a recovery process and then that gets retransmitted. And that's all hardware layer physical layer link retry basically. And so it's, it's super nice because like once you ship a packet out, it's either getting to the destination or like maybe the destination dropped off the network or something. And so it'll never get there. But like at that point, it kind of doesn't matter anyway. Um, but there's, there's no way for the switches to really drop packets unless you tell them to. And so you get this really robust communication framework uh, that you don't actually see. So like if I fired off UDP packets, that's pretty easy to do with an FPGA, but like that UDP packet can get dropped basically anywhere. Uh, right. you know, along the, the, cause like, that's how it works. And like, right. so, uh, so that's cool. I would say one of the things we learned doing that is that when you're running ethernet frames on top, ethernet does have some assumptions about like congestion and like, and when like a node drops off the network and everything like backs up, you can actually like deadlock your whole network if you're not careful. And so you have to have a way to like figure out that nodes disappeared and like drain FIFOs and stuff because otherwise you can back stuff up. Um, so, that, you know, those those are like exciting various you know things that we discovered there. But but generally it's CERTES based, very reliable. It was pretty easy to build uh, RTL transmitters. Uh, for that and we could send you know packets and that kind of thing so it was a really good fit i think for that application i believe that it's used in uh, a lot of base stations as well okay so you can yeah. find some you can find some dsps and some stuff with some rapid io on there so interesting yeah i was gonna uh, ask how it how it impacted the software but uh, the fact that you can run ethernet over it uh is definitely a, a huge benefit there and i imagine that uh one reason why it may not be uh, more widely adopted is you, you all had the benefit of having kind of like control of the ho whole system. Right. And we do. that, yeah. that massively increases the value yes. there. It sounds like. Yes, it sure does. Yeah. And it, I mean, yeah, we own the whole network and mm -hmm. the only things there that plug into that network were things that, you know, like were our, you know, our subsystems. Right. So right. we don't have to interop with other things. Um, it's also more expensive than ethernet. So like, if you just need ethernet, just use ethernet, right? Like that, mm -hmm. that's the right answer. But it, in this application, it was, it was neat. And, and we could, you know, this is an area where like, because we had FPGA to FPGA communication, we could effectively download new, new wires. So like, a, a system could decide it wants to set, you know, one subsystem and another subsystem that never talked before could get an update. And now they can have, you know, some kind of virtual communications channel between them. And so, mm -hmm. you know, in, in a previous generation system, if that didn't work, you either had to like have software, like shuffle it through a bunch of different bridges, or you'd have to add like a physical set of wires to the system as part of an upgrade in order to allow these two subsystems that didn't used to need to talk and now want to. And so with everybody being on zero rapid IO, so long as everyone has uh, the LEs available to like build new catchers or new transmitters, like you can kind of you have a lot of flexibility so it, it was a really it was a really neat uh neat protocol and because we were able to abstract a lot of that into like a common core platform the users of that really only had to deal with the packets that they wanted to deal with and like the mm -hmm. transmitters were all pretty uh you know baked and so you just you know put in a few different things and you could pretty pretty easily come up to speed on you know you get a lot of stuff for free basically that like the packet's going to show up on the network and get caught by the the person who uh who wants to get it you know with with almost no work i mean you get to like cookie cutter it down so right. that was pretty fun that kind of uh leads to one of the last things i wanted to ask about um uh, you know working on these um ct scanners once the the systems are like out the door like in use right how are y'all updating them? Did y'all, did y'all do things like, you know, over the air updates or what was the frequency at which firmware or bit streams are being updated? Oh yeah. I mean, it, it varied a lot. I would, I would say 
so uh, you know like like most big capital purchases you often have a uh you either have uh, a maintenance contract where you're getting updates, you know, as software patches come out, uh, or you have, uh, you know, in some cases you'll have uh, bugs or things where you're like, you have to update everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like, you know, like that stuff would go out. Uh, I mean, like, and that's like the whole system software kind of a, as a, as a general thing, including bit streams and all the embedded code. Um, you know, I, Update frequency probably depended on on the program. You know, you're you're looking at a, like a whole software package for a medical device. It's a huge undertaking in order to do. So you have a lot of validation and verification that occurs in order to make that happen. Uh, you know, probably somewhere in the like, I don't know, two or three a year would be a okay. pretty rapid pace for doing deployments. I would say. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that they're, I mean, I, I have no idea the speed at which they're doing updates now. Uh, but m for the most part, uh, that required uh, service personnel to be on site for that yeah. upgrade. And so they had, you know, because it's, it, you're really, you're upgrading the whole thing. So you're, you're doing, uh, you're doing the like host Linux OS and you're doing, you know, you're like, you're putting a DVD or a USB drive or something into a computer and like doing like a full on clean installation. Um, I do think they they had some ability to push patches as well, and so that would happen for you know for very minor kinds of things. But like uh, the other benefit with big software releases is you you often have the opportunity to sell the new features, right? And so mm -hmm. if there if there are new features, then you know you want to have you know you might get new features and you might get some like new covers or you might get you know some new accessory or some other thing and so those become saleable features and you know they they work with the the customers to you know get those upgrade plans in place that's fascinating yeah i i feel like that um you know these kinds of systems uh, you you mentioned the importance of them at, at the beginning of the show but um the all the work and effort and the complexity of them is not something we we usually think about right even i've i've never experienced using one of them before but um, right. even if you did right you'd probably just not be thinking about it so it's uh it's really interesting to hear kind of uh behind the scenes and it sounds like that was a uh because of the complexity of it there was like a, a wide breadth of experience that you got from being in that field oh, yeah. and, and learning about it yeah it was i mean it was it was super neat to be on that team i mean we had you know complicated uh you know field debug complicated uh like, like service uh you know service and upgrades and like a lot of these you know installations are are targeted for like 10 or more years of life and so you like these products are going to go into a hospital somewhere and work for a really long time and they're going to need upgrades and they're going to need maintenance and you know if a, a chip vendor obsoletes the chip that you're using then you're going to be building replacement boards that swap that chip out with some software updates and and so you know you know a whole like wide breadth but it, it was was a really great place to uh you know get my teeth cut on a very complicated system i mean the i feel like a, a ct is like at least as complicated as a car is today with all of the right. stuff going on possibly more so in some ways and probably less so in in other ways and it was neat you know we had a team that was doing everything from high power electronics to high speed digital and and mechanical stuff kind of and so you get a lot of exposure to like oh you know this is how sheet metal gets built and i mean right. like that stuff is super valuable when you know like especially as i moved over to oxide that was a um that's a place where like we get to wear a lot of hats cause we're a small team here. And you know, like our whole team, like when I started was smaller than my hardware team was at GE when I started at Oxide. I mean, I, I think I'm employee like 32, maybe something like that. So the whole, like everybody gets to do all kinds of stuff and having some experience like, Oh yeah, I know what sheet metal is. And like, I can, you know, I can like pretend to talk to people about this stuff and maybe get to get us to where we need to get is, right. you know, was, was super good, but, but yeah, being on a team that makes physical things is, I mean, it's just, uh, it's a really exciting experience, I think. And, um, it, it's fun to be able to like hold the thing that you, you worked on it and watch it, like, you know, watch its LEDs blank or, you know, like, you know, right. oh, it gets warm. Like I can feel the heat <laughs> on it. So. Right. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about kind of, uh, making the decision to, to move over to Oxide. Obviously you had been at GE for a long time. So, um, I imagine, you know, it was a, a pretty, 
um, compelling, uh, you know, place to join. So talk to, talk to me a little bit about, um, the decision to do that. And also, I guess, you know, for folks who may not be familiar with Oxide, what, what y'all are doing. Sure. So, yeah, so Oxide is making rack scale computers, uh, for people who want to have on-prem cloud infrastructure. So, uh, there are reasons why people might want to have hardware, uh, on-prem and when they want it on-prem uh, they would still like to feel that like the cloud native uh, api you know api driven uh, no vmware you know that kind of thing so uh so oxide's building something for those kinds of companies companies that that need hardware in their data center and uh, they need to own their hardware but they they would like the cloud experience for managing that they don't want to have a whole team you know plugging in a bunch of you know commodity boxes and like building out network things so when when you buy an oxide rack like the rack comes out of out of the crate and you unwrap it and uh, we've had customers who are you know up it was up and powered up on their network in you know a matter of hours and mm -hmm. you know they're ready to go so not a data center person spending you know four days doing network routing and that kind of thing all all of the the rack is all built in uh, essentially the rack is it's got two big switches and up to 32 sleds uh which are uh, you know milan based they're these like big server hardware so you know a terabyte of ram um you know multi-core processors lots of lots of ssds that kind of thing so but you buy it and you buy it like at the rack level so you buy a mm -hmm. rack and you get a rack or you buy four racks and you get four racks so like that that's kind of the th this is not the you know it's not like oh i need two servers kind of use cases it's the like i need 32 or i need 64 servers i need you know 4000 servers that kind of that kind of a use case so uh that's that's what we're building uh as far as moving over i mean you know i i discovered oxide on hacker news actually so i, I was reading hacker news and uh one of the blog posts you know hit there and i read it and you know it's it, it was interesting uh i read a lot of hacker news so it's like oh yeah you know some some other startups doing this like interesting thing cool and so i you know read it and kind of looked at it and it was like okay like that's neat but but as i um it, it kind of got stuck in my brain, you know, like this, this like little oxide thing. And it was like, that company is like kind of interesting. Like yeah. there's something weird about, you know, like uh, Brian, our CTO has his, uh, ox the compensation as a reflection of values. That was, uh, that was a blog post that I discovered. And, you know, it was just like this, this company feels like they're doing something different and, and like, that's kind of interesting. And so, you know, that, that was like, I wasn't looking for a job right then, but like that kind of, that seed got planted in my head. And then, um, somewhere along the, along that, that same year, um, one of my close coworkers, uh, left and took a, another job somewhere else. And like, he and I were, were super close and, you know, I like really enjoyed working with him and that was kind of a sad day. Uh, you know, there at, and I was just like, oh man, like, you know, like we've been working so closely together and right. like he's off, you know, move, move to a different area and, you know, like all this. So I, I think, uh, you know, those two things really kind of like put me, I think more in the mood to like look a little bit. And as I, as I started, you know, thinking more about it and, you know, talking to my family about, you know, well, do I, do I want to do this? It was just like, you know, yes, like I, I really do want to try this. Like this is something different mm -hmm. and it's something, it's a, it's an opportunity I have. And, you know, when I, when I looked on their website, it was like, oh, they're hiring uh, electrical engineers. Like that's, I'm an electrical engineer. Like I might right. be able to do this. <laughs> and so, um, so, you know, I applied and went through the process and the, pr the process is like a little bit different. You know, you do a lot of writing and a, a lot of uh, storytelling in your application process and kind of, kind of worked my way through that. Got the opportunity to talk to Brian and, you know, I mean, one of Brian's, the first things he was like, he's like, you know, you've done a lot of FPGA stuff. Like we don't have that much to do for FPGAs right. and, 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 you know, it was like, okay, you know, that's, that, that's okay. I think, you know, I, I've worked on a hardware team for, you know, 16 or 17 years. So like, I know how to schematic review and I know how to, you know, do this stuff. And like, I'm, I'm kind of looking for something, you know, a little different. And so anyway, that all worked out. So in May of 2001, I got the oppor the opportunity to join Oxide. And I mean, it's, it's funny because like my, my former coworker who 
left, uh, actually ended up applying and coming over to Oxide eventually. So we're working together again, which is which oh, is kind of awesome. fun, as well as an, another one of my uh, XGE con- uh, XGE coworkers. So we have kind of a um, a group of people that like have really enjoyed working together with each other for quite a number of years. Are over here at Oxide now, uh, you know, doing computer servers and and network switches and stuff. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, uh, when you you mentioned joining kind of early on uh, in the company's history, right? Just thirty two people, and given especially yep. the scale of what y'all are doing, that that is a very small number. Um, what was it like coming in? What what was kind of the state of the product at that point? And you know, what did you start working on, and how has that evolved over time? Yeah. So, uh, state of the project, uh, we were late. I mean, you know, like like all good engineering right. projects, right? Like right. you're late. I feel like you're late the when you start, right? But um, the um, I was the third or fourth electrical engineer uh, on the team, and so like okay. they had started hiring electrical engineers in 2021, but had kind of been like you know, I mean, the company was formed uh, like in uh, 2019, I believe, and so you know they had had some amount of time. Uh, they were trying to work with a contractor and uh, get get some of the electrical design done but you know uh one of the like ethos i think at oxide is like really doing things from the ground up and understanding uh like understanding where you're coming from why you're doing the thing and and really like from first principles and i think it was a challenge to instill that um into you know a a partner or a contractor and just and like and it's it's a challenge to you know, really like you, we want to own this stuff and we want to, but it's hard to do that when you don't have employees, I think. And, and mm-hmm. I think that's a, that's a challenge generally. And I'm sure that there are some times that that can work out. Uh, but in this case, it was one of those things where like, you know, we didn't want to take AMD's reference design and just plop it down on a, uh, on a, you know, a different circuit board and go like, we wanted to do things really differently. And, and but you need people engaged in that and you need people who like are ready to join that kind of uh like movement i feel like right. and and without that it's just really hard to get successful outcomes so when i join i mean we joke i say that like uh, when I joined, the house was still on fire. Uh, you know, like the the guys who came before me. I mean, Tom and RFK especially had started a little earlier, and um, you know they were trying to get like you know get the train back on the tracks. But um, you know the schematic, like we had a lot of schematic work and a lot of a lot of stuff to do. So we were right in the middle of. Uh, I mean, theoretically, we were going to tape out the gimlet server board so the server board was gonna be the first board that we were going to build out and we were supposed to tape that out i think in june maybe and you know like it kind of dragged on a little bit i mean we got in there and i mean there was a lot of you know a lot of cleanup and a lot of changes and we realized like some things weren't communicated very clearly and you know anyway lots lots of stuff uh but you know you had uh, and then, you know, thankfully, you know, I mean, we had Eric and Aaron join and uh, Ian eventually. And so a lot of, a lot of good people joined kind of, you know, along this, this process. Um, but, you know, we, we had to like write the ship and get, get the, uh, get the schematic out the door so we could build these parts and then, uh, and do bring up. And, you know, I, we have uh, on, I think uh, you mentioned Oxide and Friends. We have a couple of, of different episodes that talk through some of the, the war stories of bringing some of that hardware up and, you know, the, um, I mean, various, you know, it, it's been interesting cause like we're, it's a remote company. So like, we're not all like able to go to the office every day. Like, and, and there isn't like an electronics lab that we all share, which is right. kind of how life was before. And so, you know, bringing up Gimlet, um, I mean, I, I remember, so our, our, ma- our contract manufacturer and partner is in Minnesota. So that's, uh, I'm up in Wisconsin. So it's, you know, it's about four ish hours away. Um, and I remember, so we had been there at, in Minnesota to do bring up and had kind of gotten, I mean, we'd gotten a lot of problems figured out on the board and, you know, because the board had kind of been handed off and handed off, it's kind of like the, I mean, they're just like, you know, problems at all of the seams. Right. And, you know, it was right. like, you could, you could see like, had we done this differently and we had like one team own the thing, like it just would have been a little bit smoother for sure. Um, but we had we had spent two weeks there in Minnesota with you know a bunch of people coming in from you know all over the country, uh, getting the thing built up. And when we we you know we our two weeks was up, 
the server still didn't boot, but it kind of mostly powered on. But, you know, we had, you know, a pretty big ding list of a lot of rework to do and everything. And so Mm -hmm. um, I remember uh, like a week or two later, I had to drive halfway back there and I met one of the uh, one of the employees from Benchmark, our ODM, you know, and our two minivans and we pull up and we like I pull all of these servers out, you know, in in the (laughs) in the parking lot of like a a cheese store or something, which is a very like Wisconsin thing. Right. So, uh, but you know, we're, and putting all those in, so I brought them back to my house and then, you know, Eric is here local. And so he and I finished some of the rework on that stuff and kind of shipped them out as we got things to boot and everything. But yeah, you end up, you end up doing a lot of like, you know, strange stuff. I mean, I, I had done some rework and some soldering at GE just for, you know, being norm, you know, being like normal debug process on a circuit board and that kind of thing. And so, but you know, got, got, even more opportunity to do a lot of that on this stuff. So, you know, uh, all, all all like our 12 rev a gimlets that we, you know, built, like all came through, you know, the Wisconsin manufacturing shop here and they were like piled right. up behind me and in, in my office for uh, a couple of weeks until we got, until we got them functional enough to where like we could legitimately hand them out to our teammates and you know they might actually like boot and do things. So. Right. Well, that is uh, uh, quite the story of the the cheese store handoff. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, you mentioned uh, the kind of like owning the full stack. And I'm also, um, I don't know if I'm uh, uh, saying this or admitting this, but I also read Hacker News quite a bit. Um, okay. And um, one of the things that I think uh, Oxide might be frequently accused of is like reinventing the wheel a bunch of times. Um, but one of the things that I think is short-sighted about that outlook is um yes right like it's more effort up front uh to do things a little bit different or understand the whole system or or maybe build some parts of the system yourself but you all have to support these racks once they go out right and you are going to see lots of behavior right and so like while there it may accelerate the process of developing the initial product the long-term burden that that's going to impose actually going to be pretty big so i think you know it's a it's a in the context that you are working, it's a very valid outlook to have. And, and also, you know, people externally get to benefit from the, the right. interesting things you are doing too. Well, and, yeah. And I hope that our, our customers feel like we, you know, there's like, you know, we're like the person that they have to go to. Right. And mm-hmm. then it's like, there are no excuses. I mean, we need to own our problems, uh, you know, to the extent that we can. And like that, that's where, you know, I know, uh, you know, Brian and Steve having run data centers and other things, you know, have lots of stories about like getting involved with third party, you know, third party vendors on things. And like, there's a lot of finger pointing and a lot of stuff. And like one of the core things I think for us at Oxide is really just, we, we, we want to own the stuff and we want to own all of it. And, and, you know, to the extent that we can, I mean, there, there are places where like, we just can't own that because like someone won't give us the code for that. Or, right. you know, you see there are lots of, lots of, you know, places like that, but we, we want to have ownership of as much of it as we possibly can so that we can both understand it, make sure that we have the right uh, visibility into the design and, and then also be able to fix problems and support our customers in the best way possible. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you you also mentioned um, you know the the bring up experience, and um, I'll, I'll make sure to link to uh, some of those episodes as well as um, something you didn't mention is is your blog post about uh, working uh, with remote hardware teams, which I think is really really excellent and details some of the strategies that that you all have employed that could be useful for other folks. Um, one of the things I think is um, you know, really illustrative of understanding an entire system is kind of like going from like power on to, you know, getting a terminal prompt or something like that. Yeah. Can you kind of walk me through what that looks like for the, the oxide computer? So, I mean, uh, in a functional system, I mean, it, we, we power it on and you, I mean, in, in under a minute, maybe a minute and a half, you like the system is up and running and you can get Mm -hmm. to a, you know, a serial port through, uh, through our, you know, web API and that kind of thing. Um, bring up was not that smooth. You know, some of the things that we, we went through, I mean, it took us, I think, I think December 1st was, uh, of, of that, of, uh, 2021 was when we first saw the like characters that we intended to see come out of the serial port on the, on the board. And, you know, we, I think we had done 
we had done bring up in Minnesota in sometime in early October. And so like, you know, there were, and like, there are a lot of good stories about the power supplies. And I mean, we spent a, a lot of time with AMD and Renaissance trying to get, you know, the power supplies to handshake appropriately. And, you know, there's there a bunch, bunch of stuff that went in there, but um, it, you know, it was so exciting. I remember getting on uh, and, you know, this is like the remote company thing. I don't have, I mean, uh, I don't have a bunch of engineers like living in my house. Right. So right. Uh, I mean, uh, my coworker Eric was over here a bunch during that time as we, you know, went through and it, it sometimes it's helpful to have two people in a spot to, you know, debug. But I remember, uh, like December 1st setting up a, a meet, a Google meet and, you know, getting the whole team on there to watch like serial port characters come out the, you know, out the serial port the first time. And it was like, it was so exciting. You know, we had the little, yeah. you know, get all the way to the end. And it's like, Oh, Lumos booted. And here's our, you know, or maybe it wasn't, it wasn't a Lumos booting first. It was first our, our, nano blurs our little like bootloader and uh you know one of our engineers had put a uh, a nice little like you know banner there and so you know you could see like oxide and anyway it was just it was like super exciting to see you know this this thing that we've been working so hard on for for so many months and and even some of the team members for you know years at this point uh you know booting and and coming up yeah absolutely and and i know y'all uh you know have kind of a non-traditional um, software booting system and that you don't have like a BIOS or anything like that. Right. Um, what is the, uh, what is the process for, for booting there and what parts of the system are involved? So, uh, so to boot this stuff, I mean, it, you know, there's, there's a bunch of complicated things and, and like getting back to FPGAs, even in order to get all the power supplies up in the proper order to make the AMD processor happy and start, you know, there's a whole handshake process that happens. So we have a sequencer at P FPGA on, it's a little, uh, lattice ice, ice 40, uh, 8,000 LE, but it's, it's probably only a quarter full. It's not doing a whole lot. Um, and so it does all of the power handshaking to get all of the different rails up in the right order. You know, you got to bring your DDR rails up in a specific order. You have to bring some of your core power supplies up in, you know, finally. And then, you know, at the very end, you send like a PM bus message to one of the power supplies and says like, go. And then, then the thing goes. And, uh, and so at that point you have the AMD processor has an internal, uh, an internal core called the PSP. And so it has some firmware that it loads out of flash and it runs its own little binary that we don't get to see. Right. So like that's something AMD provides us. Um, and so it does some wake up stuff. It goes out and does DDR training, uh, for whatever dims are, it figures out what dims are installed, does DDR training, and then, uh, hands, hands that over to the, the main x86 CPU. And at that point we start running, uh, at the time we were running, uh, like a little shim called nano, nano bootloader. Uh, we're now running a slightly different version of that called Pico bootloader. Uh, but it's, it's basically a rust boot based bootloader, uh, okay. a couple of the software team members. And so we start executing X86 code and that does just enough stuff to start Helios, which is our Lumos operating system. And then Helios starts. And so that like, that's, that's the whole boot process really with no bios. So there's no UEFI, you know, UEFI, uh, none of that, stuff is in there. It's just, we try to take our code starts with the first X86 instruction. And then, you know, we do just enough stuff to like, you know, set memory up and set the hardware up in such a way that it can run. And then the OS takes over and does the rest of the setup and, you know, gets us into like multi-core mode and, you know, all the different things that happen. Gotcha. That's really interesting. The, uh, I know there's also a, a, a service processor, right? Um, and, and that's yes. the one that, um, uh, y'all uh, have, have written your own um, small OS for. Um, what role right. does it play? Um, I, I imagine it's primarily playing a role before that boot up process or is it ongoing? Right. Yeah. And it, it's, it's kind of the conductor for the boot up process, right? So okay. it, um, it wake, it wakes up, um, Let's see. So the service led architecture, we basically have three main power states. We have the power state where you're just you're connected to the rack, but nothing I'll say nothing is up, but actually a few things are up. So we have ignition, which is a little tiny ICE 40 FPGA. And he talks an AB 10 B encoded custom protocol uh, to the sidecar switches. Then that just provides uh, sled detection and basic sled power control. And so okay. that that is one power domain. And then um, 
when he has been instructed to turn on, or uh, I believe in, in most cases, he turns it on automatically once he configures out of, out of flash. Um, the, the, we start the SP power domain so that the SP comes up, SP loads the FPGA, um, you know, the SP starts uh, its management network stuff. So we have all of kind of our, like, um, all of our core management functionality, the, the, SP shows up, uh, hubris boots, SP shows up on the management network. So now, now we can actually talk to the sled, uh, almost like, uh, like the BMC, like a BMC in a traditional server, right? So it's sitting mm-hmm. there and we can get to it, even though the AMD processor is off, we have a, the little arm based SP. Uh, and it, so it's up and running and it can talk on the management network. And so then, uh, the SP decides to turn the, uh, the AMD processor on. And so the AMD processor, then, you know, the, the SP has to like tell the FPGA to go like wiggle all the power supplies and do the thing. And so it goes and wiggles all the power supplies. And, you know, then the AMD processor starts to boot and the SP monitors what the FPGA is doing. And so then once the FPGA figures out, or the FPGA has got enough stuff sequenced, the SP tells does that final PM bus command to uh, the core supplies to tell them to start operating. Uh, and then uh, it has a serial link between it and the AMD processor. And okay. so it, can, it actually has, um, it actually has two. So it can see the serial port, traditional serial port that you would see. It also has a separate serial port for uh, like intercommunication. So we like, that's how it can tell like what OS is booting. And, you know, there are a few kinds of power control things and like sideband that isn't necessarily like user terminal stuff. And that all goes through there. So the SP is really the thing that coordinates. And so when, when a control plane wants to, you know, like take it out or whatever, we can go and have the SP cycle the sled or, Mm. or we can go upstream of that and say, have ignition cycle the sled, depending on, on what we want to do. But the the SP's job is basically to sit there and, and be a management interface for the sled so that the, the rack can treat that as a, um, as a resource and we can get debugging information out of there. We can, it monitor, it does the the control, the thermal loop is running on the SP. So we have, you know, fans that keep everything cool. And so it, and temperature sensors on the board. And so the SP is doing all of that as well. Gotcha. And, uh, another thing that I, I've heard about the, uh, kind of like FPGAs that are, that are in the system. And I think you mentioned two, two different FPGAs that are currently in the system. Um, yep. believe that, uh, uh, you are using uh, open source tool chains um, for for your um, bitstream development um, and, and programming. What has that experience been like? And I, I know there's like it, lots of folks I talk to have uh, very differing opinions on the state of open source FPGA tool chains. Sure. Um, and I'm curious about you know you have obviously lots of experience with proprietary tool, tool chains and now using um, open source alternatives. Uh, what, what's kind of your, uh, take on the, the current state of them? I mean, I think it's complicated because so like I, the open source tool chains are really cool. I think they're, they're awesome. Um, but like they're in this weird spot because like they're always playing with one hand tied behind their back at least mm-hmm. because the information about the chips isn't open. And right. so, you know, like I feel like most companies would not make a processor today that doesn't have documented enough stuff so that you could get LLVM support. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but like FPGAs aren't like that. And so like everything that the open source tool chain has done is amazing. Uh, but it's all had to be like manually reverse engineered. And I mean, it's just, it's super painful. And I mean, as far as like how to get like new chip support and that kind of thing. And so, but I like, I'm sad because I, I feel like when you look at the software world and all of the explosion that we have there, right. Open source compilers. I I mean, they mostly just make sense. I don't know that there's a whole lot of, of people out out there thinking, well, I would like to hide my information from an LLVM because I don't want the open tool chain to like, no, you would like, you, you want to use like, you know, you want to use like these professional grade open source tool chains by and large. I mean, you can also buy some proprietary compilers for sure. And they may have reasons to do that. Um, but I, I, my hope is that over time at the FPGA companies embrace a more open interface, uh, so that we can, you know, better have things like an LVM story, um, with, with this stuff. Now I would say the, the, like we're using Yosis and we're using the ice, like, um, the ice 40 tool chains there. Uh, they work, they work great. 
Um, I we haven't had any real major issues with them at all, uh, but you are missing certain things. So and and you know like I think this is kind of where you end up on a lot of stuff. You're missing features that either aren't needed or aren't wanted, or or maybe just haven't even been developed or are difficult to develop, right? And so, uh, a big missing feature to me is like no chip scope or signal tap. Uh, just integrated into the tool, like being able to uh, do an incremental fit and add signal tap or chip scope and be able to see, you know, what thing you're looking at inside the chip is a super critical feature that you see in the proprietary tool chains. And, and partly, I think, because if they give you those tools, they get less support cases. Right. And so like, you know, if you can go, you know, if you can go fish a little bit for yourself, then, uh, it, you know, it's not a big deal, but like those tools are super powerful. And, and like, you know, I can't tell you the number of times you have some like tricky problem that you need to go find and like being able to go stick a logic analyzer in your design, uh, is, is critical and being able to stick it in your design, uh, and run an incremental compile is also sometimes very tricky, like very important for debug. Like if I just went and coded my own logic analyzer, which I can totally do in, you know, in all of these tools and drop it in wherever I want. Um, it's a little more annoying because like I have to change my design and I have to like stick stuff in there and I'm going to get like a massively different fit. And depending on what kind of problem I'm looking for, you know, I may chase, I may chase that problem away, especially, you know, if it's a timing problem or a clock crossing problem and you're looking for, you know, like what, what the heck is going on here? And a lot of times the like signal tap isn't even necessarily the tool that gets you to the answer, but it allows you to see like what's going on and you get ground truth for like, okay, I'm getting corrupted data here. How could I be getting mm-hmm. corrupted data here? Oh, I have botched a clock cross or I have, you know, done something wrong somewhere else or, you know, like, like you're sending me incorrect data, but it gets you ground truth. And so you can see like the bits or the packet or whatever. And like that, that's a critical feature, I think. Uh, additionally, I think uh, critical features are around uh, like timing constraints and timing analysis. And, uh, you know, any moderately complicated FPGA, I mean, I, I have to laugh because in college they would say, you know, it, don't worry about designs that have more than one clock domain. Uh, when you get to a design that needs more than one clock domain, you'll know how to do it. Right. And it's like, it's just totally <laughs> not true. <laughs> and, and when you look at like a modern design today, especially with transceivers, you know, every transceiver, is, I mean, you got two clock domains at least right there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I was working on a, uh, a design where I had, you know, multiple transceiver interfaces going into a system clock domain and then going back out another transceiver interface. And so, you know, you might have eight or 12 clock domains in, you know, in play in like a moderately, you know, small piece of logic. And it's like, like those are real problems. And so being able to get to ground truth in the tools for whether you meet timing uh, is, is critical there, especially with multi-clock domains and IO timing constraints. So, you know, a lot of the IO that we're doing is super fast and being able to uh, conclusively prove build, build over, build over, build. I have constrained this interface, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a Zowie interface or maybe it's uh, you know, some kind of high speed, you know, like spy interface or something like that. I've constrained this with these constraints. My timing analyzer runs, I get a pass, like it's going to work. I don't have to go chase that every single time. And I'm not worried about having that fall apart every time I build it is, is critical. And I think those are areas where, um, it's challenging, I think, with the open source tool chains because they like those features sometimes require more intimate knowledge of the chip. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like better timing models and, you know, like, and that stuff just isn't available. And so like, I don't know what the answer is there, but I do feel like there, there is kind of a gap there in in my experience. And I, I hope that that gap goes away. I hope that, um, companies, you know, start to embrace the, you know, open tool chains. I know the, the, I think quick logic, uh, Mm -hmm. is supporting open tool chain kind of like from their, you know, like from their Genesis. And so like, that's pretty cool. Um, I believe, it might be green pack. That's also doing something like that, okay. but, uh, but they're like little tiny. I mean, the green packs are, that's a cute little device, but like, they're like little tiny little things from Renaissance and, um, not, not quite the like big size FPGAs that we need, but I I'm hopeful that like, those are, you know, that that's the like 
opening, you know, salvo to more openness in the FPGA so that we can get better tool chains and better tools and like being able to go and inspect, like when I have a compiler bug or I have a IP problem, being tied to a vendor and their response cycle and their understanding of my problem and the fact that like they're not here and they can't, you know, they don't have a reproducer necessarily and they don't have my hardware. Um, you know, being able to go look in an open tool chain is super awesome because you can go there mm -hmm. and say like, look, I, you know, yeah, I mean, I might not be an expert here, but I can go like change this thing and I can go rebuild it and see if it does something. And, you know, you get a whole different kind of investigation that you can do. So I'm hopeful that, you know, the industry is headed that way. That way I think it's going to be, I, I don't know. I hope I see it before I retire. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I did see the uh, the quick logic stuff. I think that's been a few years um, ago now, and and so hopefully some of the bigger players uh, do go that direction. But kind of wrapping up here, um, you all shipped, you know, a rack and um, or multiple racks. We've shipped a, a rack yes. uh, uh, product here. Um, there's obviously you know ongoing from the things that you work on. Um, there's firmware updates and and the FPGAs, right? You could could have uh, updates as well. Um, right. but what does that kind of look like for you now that the, the product is baked to some degree, um, ongoing support for that product. And then, you know, potentially moving on to, to a next product iteration, what's kind of your responsibilities and how have they evolved there? Yeah. So we're doing a lot of, uh, scale up activity right now. So, you know, uh, I mean, making a rack, making two racks, making three racks, you know, like it's been, uh, a great learning process for us, especially on the manufacturing side, get it, you know, but mm -hmm. we need to get to a spot where like, we don't have engineers troubleshooting, uh, manufacturing line failures as frequently or, you know, like anything like that. So we're trying to get, you know, upstream, better testing upstream, better fixturing, be able to scale up so we can build way more of these, uh, efficiently like that. That's been a big focus for our whole team. Um, and then, you know, like when you look at processor life cycles, I mean, we're on, we're on Milan, right? Well, you know, uh, they've got new ones coming, right. And new ones come right. every couple of years. And so, uh, you know, so we're looking at what a next gen sled looks like that fits in, in the same rack and, uh, you know, like what going through, you know, what, what about the current architecture are we, uh, like really happy with and keeping and like what minor tweaks can we make to make our, you know, now that we've been through this whole cycle once, uh, you know, are there things that we could do differently that would make, you know, debug or visibility easier? And then, and then you have the standard thing where like a new, a new processor family is going to bring new DDR and new power supplies and new power supply topologies and new. So like, there's some things that are kind of forced on us, um, that we're going to have to change and, uh, some, some are some like minor architectural tweaks, I think for, uh, how like none of it is really like surfaced out to the user, but it's stuff that will make, um, will make manufacturing better. You know, uh, one of the things like a big challenge, I mean, this is kind of silly, but like we have a bunch of dongles that go in manufacturing in order to like bootstrap this thing and program one of these up. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, we realized, at a certain point that, you know, having multiple dongles connected is kind of annoying from a, uh, like manufacturing standpoint. Right. Uh, but given where we were in the program and like the resources and the timings that we needed to hit, there wasn't really an opportunity to go and like redesign or do something, you know, smarter there. And so we're working on, you know, like a single plug-in interface where we can get all of our, you know, all of our stuff into one like consolidated, you know, dongle so we can get manufacturing programming and tests done uh, a little more efficiently. And that helps the, that helps our manufacturing partner so that, you know, there's less places to go wrong and makes, you know, your cycle times go up. And so, you know, when you think about if we want to make a hundred or, you know, a thousand servers, like, you need to do things that uh, scale better than, you know, may, than what we have that, you know, works for, you know, 10 or even a hundred racks maybe. So. Right. That makes those sense. Those are, so yeah, those are areas that we're, we're actively working on now for sure. I mean, uh, we're, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, what our, what FPGA is our next sled's going to use, um, you know, that kind of thing. So. Awesome. Well, uh, I'll definitely be uh, following along uh, as, as y'all continue um, building new things and, and uh, recently been open sourcing uh, a lot of different things. So um, that's awesome to see. Um, 
So Nathaniel, thanks for uh, joining uh, for this episode. It's definitely super informative. We covered uh, a lot of, of different topics and um, I hope I uh, can have you back on in the future uh, to talk more about what y'all do in the next iterations at Oxide. Yeah, awesome. Thanks very much. It's been fun to talk about all this stuff. I like this stuff is so exciting and it's fun and it's it's just nice to be able to talk about it and uh, you know help get other people excited about it and and I, the stories are just fun even so. Absolutely, absolutely agreed. Um, all right, well have a have a good rest of your day, Nathaniel. Great, thanks.